Good morning, everybody. Let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to chair this uh, uh, meeting uh, and uh, welcome you all in the University of Aveiro. Well, I didn't take the morning train as my colleague previously. That's too early for me. Uh, so I came yesterday, got a nice sleep here, and uh, which is a much better idea than starting very early in the morning. And uh, I know I noticed that uh, uh, the airplane gods are against playing against us. Many of our colleagues that should be sitting <coughs> here are stayed at home because they couldn't take a flight. Well, that's too much for us, uh, certainly too much for me. I can't hope to uh, solve this problem. But um, like all coins, it has two sides. Uh, you know, on the one side, we lose at least one, probably two members of the panel, which is bad. But on the other side, the courageous, the brave members of the panel that are here have more time, okay. which is good. So you always have the good and the bad of everything. Uh, let me start by... Uh, so you have more time than you expected, so make good use of it, please. <laughs> <laughs> On my right hand side, Antonio Murta. Antonio Murta has come uh, to the north from the University of Ominho uh, and the University of Oporto, and is now um, really a champion of the use uh, <laughs> of internet in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, here in Portugal. So he's, I'm sure he's going to make a, an interesting uh, presentation of his work and the importance of the internet in his work. Uh, I'll introduce also, right from the start, Michael Lee from Extreme Right, João Barros. João Barros used to be simply a university professor with a very distinguished curriculum, but uh, recently has become an entrepreneur uh, based on the work that he has done on the university, basically on ad hoc networks and network coding. So I'm sure he will also tell you a lot about how to move from the realm of university and theory into practical things, companies, products that people are willing to buy. So this is basically the two teams we have. If the airplanes come in at any time, we might have a third <laughs> speaker, but I'm not sure he comes or doesn't come. Okay, so let's <coughs> start from the beginning. Antonio, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Okay. Very, very good morning to all of you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to really uh, uh, just talk briefly about what I perceive as the importance uh, of the Internet um, for society as a whole and for Europe specifically. We've been uh, used to do it for a while, but by now, shall we say that it is very difficult to even imagine a few processes, uh, a few things that we do on a daily basis without the Internet. Um, I think that, that, that that's very positive, certainly. Uh, we've done, we've accomplished incredible things in the last few years, but that also brings a number of challenges. I, I, I would like to talk about the challenges. On one side, and I'm saying these obviously as, as, as a, a person that on an active basis, on an active way participates on this process on a daily basis. On one side, I see internet as, as a weapon of competitiveness. Um, the processes are going more and more digital. We, we see what we call digital convergence occurring all over the world. In the last two days, I've, been, I've, I've actually chaired a, a session of life sciences. Imagine an engineer surrounded by PhDs and medical doctors uh, sharing a session of life sciences. And I was dazzled 
um, completely dazzled by a number of things that are going on in life sciences. Let me tell you just about a few of them. I don't know if you know about a, a small company called Proteus. Proteus is a company that basically puts a ship inside every pill. I don't know if you know that medical compliance, uh, specifically pharma compliance, is one of the biggest problems in the world. Uh, basically, when we are um, prescribed a given medicine by a doctor, 40% uh, of the times, we don't do it. Uh, in many instances, we lie to the doctor, okay? Uh, in many instances, we simply forget ourselves. Um, this is a very serious issue because actually, um, um, in some cases, this can cause major problems like with Alzheimer. In some other cases, it can cause also, that simply put, the, the, the therapy is not effective. Now, these guys that have invented a biodigestible ship, one that you can take in your stomach, don't get any problem, um, basically allow the ship to communicate with a patch that is in your, in your shoulder to signal to the society that I've taken the pill. Now, I was dazzled by this because this is not an experiment. This is now fully working. This has gone through clinical trials on animals. This has gone through clinical trials on humans. And by now, this is a product that is commercially available. Why am I talking to you about this? I would like just you to think a little bit about what this means. I don't know if you know about, for example, diabetes. Diabetes in my country represents 1% of GDP. We have 10% of diabetic people, but just by, by themselves, they consume or they need money to be allocated on the proportion of 1% of GDP, 1.6 billion euros every year. Moreover, one knows, unfortunately my father died out of complications of diabetes. I don't know if you, if you know that, but diabetes is a very lethal disease. It's silent, it does not for many, many years gives you any warning, and at some point in time when you discover the, the consequences. You can be either getting gangrene, which is not very popular, um, or you can get glaucoma and go blind, or you can simply have a stroke and die of a, of a stroke. My father died out of the second stroke. Um, he was not disciplined. You also should know that in diabetes, uh, a, 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 a patient that is uh, disciplined actually can carry a normal life almost normal life. A patient that is undisciplined not only costs the society five times more than the disciplined one, but actually he has huge danger for himself. Now, so what I want you to understand is that basically the fact that you have now ships inside pills that can mean that you can track that the therapy is really being implemented or not, it means that literally we can distinguish the disciplined diabetic people from the undisciplined ones. Now that's a major thing, because if we could do this for the 10% of diabetic people in Portugal, our bill of 1.6 billion would be reduced in a couple of years to less than a billion. We would save immediately 600 million per year. Now that's not a minor thing for a tiny country like us, this is actually significant numbers. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you that actually we are still scratching the surface of what we call internet. The internet of things has just started. Inditex is the largest fashion company in the world. They're just 200 kilometers away in the north of Galicia. In the last few years, they started tagging all their garments, all of them. This suit, is actually not from them, but it could be. Um, and if it would be a soup fr from da Massim Duty, it would have a tag from them. Uh, now, this is interesting because, again, what can you do with tags in garments? You can do things that are a bit weird. 
um, uh, for example, this is so something that men will do, ladies probably not, okay? Imagine that you, you get your luggage lost, and uh, simply put, you're in England, and as we all know, they have different numbers. Uh, they never use whatever we use in continental Europe. And uh, so the numbers are not the same. So I don't know my number of shirt in the UK. If I would have my, my, my phone, and my phone would know my measurements, I could ask the shirt, do you suit me? <laughs> it could check compatibility between the shirt and me and my body. Now, if I can do this with a shirt, I can also do it with uh, a normal food package to understand if the food package has gluten or not. If I'm allergic to gluten, it's kind of important to know if that product has gluten or not. So I'm just saying to you, gentlemen, that although we've done a lot, I think that we just started. There's a conference in California that I love. I've never been to the conference, but I track, uh, I track the conference for a huge number of years. Uh, I'm, no, I'm now almost old. Uh, um, the, company, the conference is called All Things Digital. And I think that uh, if you want to have a glimpse of what we shall be doing in the next few years, I think that you should take a look at the last few, um, um, shall we say, uh, proceedings of that conference, because you'll see some wacky things. Coming back to the pills, I don't know about uh, many things, but I do know that every, my mother is a nurse. I'm not a doctor because I don't have the guts to be a doctor, because I actually I would love to be a doctor, okay? A medical doctor. I admire that. It's a very noble profession. But you need to have courage. The second um, suicide rate in professional, in, in terms of professions, is the second suicide rate in the world. It, you need to be courageous and uh, disciplined if you are a doctor. If you if you don't have that kind of characteristic, you can't be. Simply put, because you face tough stuff on a daily basis, every day. Okay, it's not popular. Okay. Now, one of the things that happens in hospitals is that, unfortunately, human beings like nurses and doctors swap pills. And as a consequence of that, many people die every year. I don't know about uh, the numbers of Portugal, but I can tell you that in the United States, these numbers are on the order of magnitude of hundreds of thousands. I'm saying to you that because people swap pills, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people die every year just because of a silly mistake. Now, if, you, if the pills are tagged, you can design use cases to check compatibility. And those numbers would be not zero. For sure, we'll still have a high probability of that occurring, but they will be severely reduced for sure. So what I'm saying to you is that although I sound a bit lunatic talking about pills that have a ship inside, I really feel a bit weird. Uh, on the other side, I can think about a number of things that are highly valuable, highly high impact to society that would be very interesting to get implemented. So my words are, uh, bear with us because this is just starting. I think that we will see, we tend to, to talk about the metrics as, uh, shall we say, science fiction uh, movie. I think that the matrix is going on as we speak. And actually, we don't know a lot about some of the things because there are companies that don't want that to be known. But actually, the, the kind of things that we're seeing in the matrix in the movie are being implemented. Now, what's the flip side of that? So I really am enthusiastic about this. I, I, I have to say that, that I, I think that what we're doing to society is very positive. Now, let me say, say to you what is the dark side of this. And I have to say that uh, I would like to also touch upon the dark side, because I think the dark side deserves to be discussed. Um, I'm an engineer, but I, I'm also, before being an engineer, I'm a human being, OK? And human beings are supposedly human, OK? Which means that we should care about each other. We should show solidarity bonds, OK? Uh, I sympathize with the view of a sociologist 
called Eugeny Morozov, okay, that writes excellent stuff about technology. Uh, sociologists are very good observers of men. That's their job. They observe men, dissect men, and in a way show us like we are. Uh, uh, good and bad, that's what they do. Eugeny Morozov has been a great observer in technology and he's been, has been writing that we have been becoming so much solutionist. That's the word that he coined, solutionist. Solutionism is when you invent a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Is, is when you really spend a lot of time with stuff that is absolutely irrelevant. Now, I could name 10 companies that are worth a fortune that I would consider socially irrelevant. I think that Eugenie Morozov is very right. I think that in many instances we spend time and also a lot of uh, money on technology that actually probably not very important. And on the other side, we probably don't, in, 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 and this is the flip side of that, don't allocate time and money to, to things that should be much more important, okay? Um, I think that obviously this is also very human, okay? Uh, um, decision making uh, is not perfect, we're human, we, f we fail. Um, but it's something that we should be more knowledgeable. It's something that technologists should discuss more. Because in many instances we play like kids. We're still big kids, okay? and we don't value as much, we don't quantify and qualify the impact uh, as much as we probably should. The last topic that I would like to touch upon uh, is, is again social, okay? And it's one that, that is very important to me. Uh, on a daily basis, I'm an engineer and I, I'm an investor in IT. And as a result of that, on a daily basis, I automate work. That's my job. I normally destroy work uh, because I automate it. Um, this is good because it augments the productivity. That's why we consider the internet a major weapon of competitiveness, of pr productivity generation. But on the other side, it's also morally, it brings me problems because I can see now in the last few years that the pace that we in the pace at which we destroy work, simply put, is much bigger than the pace of creative construction of work. There was a, an economist that I like very much, uh, um, Mr. Hayek and, and, and also Mr. Schumpeter. Um, and basically Schumpeter coined this expression, creative destruction, very important. Because basically it means that whenever we destroy work, somehow the economy gets better because we we, we creatively construct also other layers of work that replace the, the previous ones with higher added value. And so society as a whole okay, may, improves. Okay? I think that Schumpeter was absolutely right, but on the last few years, I have to say, gentlemen, that, that basically I'm now worried that the pace at which we destroy work is actually much higher than the pace at which we are able as a society, as an economy, to rebuild work. Um, this means that we're building um, structural unemployment, which is a major social problem. I think that in the next 10 years, 20 years, uh, IT professionals like us will be accused by other elements of society that actually we're not helping. And we will have to bear with the discussion. We will not be able to simply uh, discard discussion. Discussion will be uh, an important one, okay? Because we all need work to feed our families, to, to guarantee that we feel good. It's a basic thing. I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, basically Gallup, Gallup is a think tank that works for very big governments. And the CEO of Gallup has wrote a book last year that basically talks about the Third World War, and he, he says that he does not know where the war will, will be played, physically speaking, but he knows the reason. The reason will be work, lack of work, okay? Structural unemployment. The numbers are striking. He basically says that there are 1.9 billion jobs missing in the world. 
most of, of those jobs are in, in underdeveloped countries. Um, but by now, we also have huge numbers in developed countries. Okay? Now, if we think that the world as a whole has 7 billion souls, 1.9 billion souls is a lot. It's a huge percentage. Okay? So, what am, I, why am I saying this to you, gentlemen? Because I think that one of the challenges that we shall face in the next few years is that we will need to consider the social impact of some of the things we do to guarantee that we, we discuss it even before we deploy it. If we don't do it, regulators will. Um, I've just seen, I've been involved with a company that has done, I mean, it's a very well-known company. Um, uh, it's one of the best um, highway software companies, uh, software for highways companies in, in the world. It happens to be Portuguese. Uh, whoever rides a, a car in our highways will notice that it's actually very, very convenient. The company is called Brisa. And they've just done, um, in something like nine months, a terrific job. Uh, they, they got breathed between commas, sorry to use the expression, um, of all the people that were working on the tolls. They've introduced e-tolls. No strikes, no nothing. They, they, they actually used good indemnities for the people. People were happy. No, no problem. Everything went smoothly. The only problem with this is that Basically, a few thousand people are now unemployed, okay, in one go, six months. By the way, the system is better. Uh, as a user, I feel better. I'm doing self-service, everything's great. The only problem is how much time does, will it take the economy to recover those jobs? Uh, I'm, I'm talking about this as an example. I don't want to penalize Breeze in any way. I think that they've done well. The issue is that we're doing this for a lot of stuff. And by now, the pace at which we invent new things is far bigger than the pace that we invent new ways of using people. So, summary, and this is where I finish. Basically, I see an incredible potential for the Internet in the next few years, namely in the Internet of Things. I think that we will talk with objects. I think that we will not need to memorize stuff We'll ask questions to objects. We'll teach objects to talk with the right people. We'll teach them like children. I don't know how much time this will take, but I believe in it. It makes sense, okay? It makes sense that I enter a supermarket and actually shop uh, with a phone that allows me to check if this product has gluten or not. It makes sense. It saves lives also, okay? It's a question of time. Uh, on the other side, uh, I also feel that we have to probably question a bit better uh, the way we use our time and our money allocation. I think that Mr. Morozov is dead right when he says that actually we, we literally, literally um, have tons of plays, some of them very valuable, with big splashes of money that are absolutely idiot. Idiot. And I, I, I don't want to quote the examples uh, because I'll, I'll be politically incorrect, but I certainly five or six come to my mind immediately. Okay? Um, and last but not least, I think that the social impact of technology is also uh, a very important thing because we need to be aware that obviously it's very positive. J j just let me explain to you this with an example. One of the things that was striking to me the day before yesterday, I was surrounded by medical doctors, some of them incredible guys. One of them was, was is an expert in MRI analytics. Basically, it takes 3D films of the brain. So these are not 3D photos, these are films. He observes the brain as an object with 3D uh, uh, shall we say, uh, snapshots. Now, what he does with that is that basically he's able to build a Google map, between commas, of all the vessels of the brain for a specific individual. Now, this is incredible, absolutely incredible, because it means 
that if I can have a, uh, um, an automatic surgeon, a machine that actually uh, is a surgeon, except it's, it's an automated surgeon, it can be precise enough to, to enter into our brain and follow the precise structure of this brain. Now, this was obviously amazing, okay? But the flip side of this is that he also told me that he's doing analytics. We call it big data. What was he telling me about? He basically was telling me about the following. Antonio, I can collect over a few years thousands and thousands of cases of cancers in the head. And after a few years, I will be able to diagnose much better than any expert in neuroimmunology in the world. A system, a piece of software, will be much better than any neurosurgeon or neuro, neuroimmunologist in the world. I'm now replacing neurosurgeons. I'm not replacing tall workers. You follow me. There's a guy that I find very weird, but also very challenging, a guy called Ray Kurzweil. Um, Ray Kurzweil uh, um, is a bit mad, okay? He's a great scientist, uh, very wacky. Uh, and he created a, a university that you should check. It's called Singularity University. Um, uh, I, 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 I have a plan to be a student, if I can get there, because they only take 60, 60 students a year. It's not only expensive, but they only take 60. By the way, Professor Van der Serf, one of the creators of the internet, is a professor in his university, okay? And Ray Kurzweil basically uh, wrote a book called The Singularity is Near. The singularity is, is, is basically the time in which he believes that a computer will be smarter than a man. He calculated the projections with uh, with, with uh, the advances in computing, and he basically computed that by 2045, we will get there. He basically says that these will be better than these. Now, that's a frightening thought, because it means a world that actually, I don't think that society is prepared for that. I don't think that we are prepared for that. Um, I, I'm just bringing this to you because I think that we, we all love technology because, again, we're a bit kids. <laughs> I certainly feel like it. Uh, I like, I like uh, to, to do some of the stuff that I do because I feel like playing. <laughs> but on the other side, we also do this professionally and we do this because we want to improve society as a whole. Mm -hmm. The moment uh, we lose track of that, actually, I mean, we're not doing the right thing. So this is what I wanted to say to you. Thank you very much for your time. Kind of attention. Thank you, Antonio, for a very provocative thought. I'm sure the audience later on would like to comment on that. Uh, please, Joao, while you're moving, I'll just uh, tell Antonio that I thought I had a, um, a smart fridge, because I can ask it what's inside and what do I need to buy. But uh, my fridge is not as smart as Antonio is telling me. Uh, oh yes, but my fridge has already the, po the, the, the possibility to tell me what's inside, how much milk I need to buy, which I think is a useful thing, because I'm always forgetting. Sir, uh, but I want to tell you something, <laughs> sorry, sorry, because this is interesting. I've worked in retail for 17 years. Zara, by now, because they have RFID tags in every garment, sure, sure. every hour they synchronize the tags with the server of the store, and they know precisely the content of the store. Every hour. You follow me? There is no short... If, if, if they want to monitor theft by the hour, they can do it. They're obviously more advanced than I am. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's now your turn. I know you're going to impress us with something different. More movement. Well, and thank you very much. <laughs> We started with our city. Uh, Porto is actually quite a nice city to develop a future internet technologies. It's a mid-sized European city. It has a multimodal transportation system uh, where the trains, the metro and the buses already have integrated information systems and also integrated billing systems. 
Uh, and very importantly, we have in Porto a fiber optical internet backbone that actually belongs to the municipality, to a company that uh, has as shareholders the municipality, the university, and a number of other entities. Uh, and why is this important? Because it allows us to do a lot of experimentation on the network, which would otherwise be very difficult to do uh, if you had uh, to work on a daily basis with the telecom operator who obviously has uh, important commercial goals and has to guarantee a quality of service uh, that uh, is 99.9999% reliable. On the other hand, the city has an entrepreneurial uh, tradition and we work very closely with our university incubator, which has generated 115 startups in the last five years and about 1,300 uh, qualified jobs. Of course, this is a drop in the GDP, but if only a few of these companies make it to larger companies, uh, we will be certainly much better off than we are right now. And as I like to say, we have 41 square kilometers of real life, so we also count on uh, the population and a number of different uh, actors inside the city with whom we work on a daily basis. Now, one of the big assets also of the, university, of the city is the, the University of Porto. Uh, it is a large university with 31,000 students, uh, and it has 14 different faculties, so we can actually combine knowledge from many different uh, areas, just like Aveiro also does, as was pointed out in the initial presentation. Now, we were fortunate to submit a proposal to the European Commission, which got funded. Uh, uh, the Future Cities project is funded through the seventh framework program and the, the capacities program. And uh, uh, it targets the development and expansion of our center of competence <coughs> for future cities, which is at its core a very interdisciplinary center. So people stay in their uh, departments and research institutes, so we don't want uh, to build an yet another uh, institution, but rather we have a very um, lightweight uh, collaborative platform where you have people from computation, communication, infrastructure coming together, but not just engineers and computer scientists, also uh, people from the arts and design, also people from social sciences and public policy, always centered uh, at people and the end users. So from the start, we work with the, the population to understand what are their needs and make sure that what we are doing actually adds uh, value to their quality of life. And so step one is to form interdisciplinary uh, uh, teams, uh, people of different ages, uh, uh, a lot uh, stronger female participation than we have this morning, uh, and from very, very different uh, angles that look at things. Uh, we are now also bringing in and have uh, for a while now also scientists from other areas, from the University of Aveiro, for example, we have Su Susanna Sargento, who is uh, bringing uh, very important uh, know-how and technology in vehicular networking. Uh, and uh, we want to uh, expand uh, this collaboration to, to many different areas. Now, the second goal, so we bring people together, the second goal is to build world-class test beds with one key characteristic, is that they work at urban scale. So we had in different departments smaller test beds with a few sensors, a few smartphones, but we wanted to do this large so that we can actually do uh, experiments in the whole city. Then, as I mentioned, work closely with the end users. We have the policemen, we have the firemen, we have uh, uh, bus drivers, taxi drivers, uh, and uh, families that are working with us and testing uh, what we, we do, and also right from the start. And uh, finally, when we get a lot of data, uh, which we are putting in the cloud, and we are still working out how best to share this data so that different people can actually extract different kinds of knowledge uh, from uh, all the data that we are gathering. And uh, from the beginning, we also worked with a lot of uh, companies. Uh, we were fortunate, actually, that uh, uh, right from the start, we had uh, companies in all sizes, so not uh, uh, just the large uh, companies uh, that are bringing in software expertise and some funding, but also all these uh, smaller companies that uh, were excited with the project, and this added a lot to the strength of our proposal. On the institutional side, we work with the municipality, but also with the regional coordination office, with uh, uh, SAE and TIS, and uh, uh, IT has provided, so Instituto de Comunicación also provided a strong uh, core of expertise to this project. And lastly, the sixth and final principle is that we want to bring the outcomes and the results to the world, not just in the form of publications and papers, but also in terms of products and services that people can actually use. And I'll talk a bit about trans knowledge transfer as we go along. Now, how do you 
manage to build the different coalitions that you need to make this work. And you have to have a value proposition to each one of the key uh, actors. And, and basically a lot of my work has been in the past uh, uh, two years to actually sell the whole concept to all these different constituencies and tr try to find what it is that will make them work together. And so for researchers, obviously it's a research question. So they, they, they need to have something that is intellectually challenging on the one hand and also will uh, get them to the best uh, journals and best conferences and will ultimately have impact. For companies, obviously, it's a business case. They have to uh, uh, figure out how they are either going to make money or save money by whatever you are doing. Then the third thing regarding the users is you have to make sure that they feel a real benefit. And uh, one of the things that's very important is that you have to make sure that the end users are not feeling like guinea pigs where they're just running experiments, but rather that they have a say in everything that goes on uh, within uh, the activities of the project that deal directly with them. And finally, very important, and sometimes we underestimate this uh, at university, is the issue of political will. Uh, if I want to install sensors in the city, I'm going to have to have the municipality engage their uh, middle management and their people and do a lot of paperwork that will uh, be much accelerated if we have political will on our side. This means we have to give also politicians something that they can tell their constituencies and their voters and their party uh, and, work and figuring this out is not always easy, but it's very important. So let me give you practical examples. One of them is, uh, involves firemen. Uh, I, my computer is taking a bit of time to start the video, but I'll just uh, tell you what's about. We have been working with two corporations of uh, firemen uh, that uh, were actually a product uh, here from uh, a spin-off of the University of Aveiro, uh, Biodevices, produced this uh, uh, vital jacket that gives your electrocardiogram in a non-intrusive way. So we integrated that with smartphones that work uh, uh, in uh, a wireless mesh. So my PowerPoint just gave up, but I'll just start it again. And, and basically the, the network uh, gathers the data, the vital signs of uh, the firemen. And so whoever is controlling the, um, whoever is controlling the, um, the operations can actually see the vital signs of, the, um, of all the um, firemen. And actually, uh, what happens sometimes in uh, fire situations is that they are, don't realize that they are suffocating or that they are about to have a heat stroke because we have all the adrenaline. So now, who, on this tablet, you can actually see their well-being, you can see the context information, and you can pull, can pull out something uh, if uh, you see that it's not going well. So just give me one second to restart the presentation. This is an old Mac, so that I should be doing. So there we go. Also to prevent and help firemen, we also deployed uh, sensors first in the uh, university building now uh, around the city. Uh, that to solve another problem. Right now, for example, in this building, you have arrows pointing out to the fastest way. But the problem is that the arrows, when they were placed, uh, you, you really didn't know where the fire was. So it can very well be that that arrow is sending you in harm's way when it was supposed to send you to the quickest way out of the building. But sometimes the quickest way of the, out of the building is not the safest one. Now these sensors are able to grasp what is going on in the, in the room uh, and in the building and direct you to the safest way out. Okay, another place where we have been developing technology that increase efficiency and safety is uh, the harbor of Porto. Uh, initially, uh, our motivation uh, also uh, uh, with our colleagues here in Aveiro was to find a place where we had a lot of vehicles uh, where we could test vehicular mesh networks and vehicular mesh networking technology. Uh, and uh, uh, the harbor seemed ideal because they have all these movable, moving parts, the trucks, the cranes, uh, the ships, obviously, uh, and they need to be coordinated somehow. And so this is already a fully operational system which we deployed uh, in Porto de Leixões. Uh, and basically, uh, with very few um, 
access points, we are able to gather tons of data from uh, the vehicles that go around. And so now uh, we are working on them to save fuel, reduce CO2 emissions, reduce noise. This is an urban port. Uh, so every time a truck has the motor on in a time where it doesn't need to have the motor on, you are generating noise for the people who live around the, the, um, the harbor. And it turns out uh, that now, once you have this infrastructure, there are tons of applications and services that the port cares about, the operators cares about, it's also an ecosystem in itself. And now the question now is how do you put this platform uh, uh, providing services for all these different peoples and also with uh, different security levels so that only those that uh, really need certain types of uh, data, can access that, that, that data and, and so on. Now, once you do that as a smaller scale in a harbor, you can think of doing this at a much larger scale uh, in the whole city. And that's what we're uh, building right now. Uh, there are two main uh, uh, parts of this uh, urban scanner, if you like. One are vehicles, so taxis and buses. The other one are smartphones of people, and, and we have the Sense My City application that is already sending lots of data from many users to the, to the cloud. Um, and the vehicle part, uh, we started as a project with IT, funded by the Carnegie Mellon Portugal uh, um, program with the University of Aveiro, University of Porto and, the University and uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and basically, initially, um, a spin-off company at the University of Porto, Link, installed these uh, computers uh, that gave us huge data sets to study uh, lots of things regarding these uh, vehicles, but also in particular for vehicular networking. We had the position of every vehicle on a second-by-second -second basis over a period of a whole year. Uh, typically, you have that, you know, 30 seconds, one minute, but if you're studying communications between vehicles, 30 seconds or one minute is just way, too, way too large. And so we started working on uh, a simulator and those data sets together with our colleagues from computer science. Here you can see we can place 30,000 micro simulated vehicles, in this case in Porto, but it could also be Aveiro or any other city if we have the maps. And, uh, and on top of that, we added networking uh, simulation and uh, um, wireless propagation. Here you have a first coarse uh, approximation, just uh, circles, but we now have fading and also line of sight of vehicles and, and buildings and, and so on. But simulation only brings you uh, up to a certain point. It allows you to say, okay, this is more or less how the network will work if we have 5% of vehicles or 10 or 20 or 30 or 80% of the vehicles connected. And it also gives you an idea of where to put place uh, access points and roadside units. But in the end, you really have to go and do real life experimentation. Uh, we actually spun off a, a company, which is a, a, a spin off of both universities, Aveiro and Porto. Uh, and, and the concept is really that these vehicles form a mesh network that covers the city. Uh, the 802.11p standard has a range that is 10 times the normal Wi Fi and very fast switching times, milliseconds. So uh, vehicles are actually ideal to work as mobile Wi Fi hotspots because they have batteries and they have this increased uh, range. And so we're proving this concept uh, together with, the, with this company and with the, the university partners. What this means, for example, here you see the position on a second-by-second -second basis of the taxis, and, and this is the area that we expect to be able to cover with Wi-Fi once all the taxis are deployed. So we're about uh, 120 now and in, in growing uh, every, every week. It's just coming out of the factory kind of just in time and, and deploying on the vehicles. Now this involves a lot of people and it's very, very hard uh, uh, to coordinate all of these things because you have the technical part uh, and you obviously have the logistical part uh, and, and all of this is, 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 is quite hard. Why do the taxi drivers uh, want this? Well, with the system, with the digital system they have for dispatching, they were able to reduce by 10 times the time it takes from the moment you call until the time that the taxi stands in front of you. You can now do it with a simple app, Taxi Link, and uh, you can even see where the taxi is and where he's coming. But for them, they came up with killer apps that we have never thought of. For example, for them, one of their favorite services is that they can now see in real time, in every taxi stand, how many cars are there, and even better, our machine learning colleagues now compute uh, a, a prediction of how long in each taxi stand they are going to wait for a customer, and so now they don't need to drive around, they just go to that one. Of course, some of them still think they know better than the computer, but <laughs> in any case, uh, this is something that they really like, and they spend a lot of time waiting, so they want to have digital content, and they are already making money putting advert 
costs for tourists in the taxis. So the more bandwidth they have, the higher the content they can provide and the better the experience for the tourists. So how do we get from the mesh network to the internet where as a matter of fact, many of our cities now have thousands of Wi-Fi hotspots. Porto is no exception. We have 40,000 Zonfon hotspots. Uh, Portugal Telecom is now putting PT Wi-Fi on a number of uh, uh, them. And so the integration of these networks uh, is, is, is very useful because all these Wi-Fi networks are actually well under capacity. So one of the things that we study is locally what kind of connections need real-time connection and we'll probably use either cellular or a roadside unit because the quality of service is better. And what are those that uh, can actually work in a delay tolerant way where it can actually just keep the data and all these vehicles can serve as data mules and then upload the data to the cloud so that it can be used for big data analytics. And so. Uh, making these smart decisions locally implies that you have to develop all the algorithms, policies, and so on. Uh, and and uh, the internet is, is really becoming more and more uh, uh, also uh, a physical uh, internet. Uh, and, uh, and Tony mentioned the internet of things. Well, vehicles are things, and they are going to be part of all this uh, world. Now, when you, once you have the taxis and the public buses, so we, we just won STCP, also the public bus company, to the project, and so we now have authorization now to deploy also these small boxes uh, that we deploy in the taxis that allow you to connect to all these different networks. Uh, and so you can see that you can really cover the whole city, and, and they are moving, so it's like a scanner. And, uh, and this is actually the sampling rates that you get in 30 minutes of getting data with taxis and buses. So the light areas are areas where you get many measurements per minute, and then obviously it gets darker, uh, but you can see that in the center of city you get some really nice uh, uh, sampling just in 30 minutes. Okay? Now this can then go to the cloud and can be used by all sorts of companies to develop all sorts of applications and services that we haven't even thought about. One last example. Uh, is also interdisciplinary. We've been working with psychologists that measure driver stress. And you know that uh, uh, we have a huge rate of uh, mortal uh, accidents and anything we can do to increase uh, uh, safety is, is, is relevant and important. Now what you see is a trip one of my students did from the School of Engineering uh, down uh, to Albuquerque, where he lives. And uh, the colors indicate their level of stress as measured by different sensors in the vehicle and by sensors on his body. So the vital jacket of uh, uh, bio devices with accelerometers and different things. And so you can look at the entire trip and green means he's relaxed, red means that uh, something happened. So you can then zoom in and now you can ask the driver, so, so what happened? Someone was overtaking from the right. Uh, you can switch uh, to 3D and then you see the velocity, the speed. And so he had to brake just before the end of the bridge. And so you can go and take a look. Okay, so here his heart rate was at 109, and he is 81 kilometers per hour. And just before, uh, you see uh, 88, so he was more relaxed, but he was actually speeding at 100 kilometers per hour. Okay. And now you gather all of this data from many, many different volunteers, and then you get areas in the city where uh, everybody always gets more nervous or more anxious. And this means that the city has to think about that juncture or that place and figure out how to organize traffic in a way that is not as stressful. Now, typically, a university project would stop here. We have a prototype. We published a nice paper. We have beautiful pictures. That's it. Um, but I, we decided to take this demo to the public bus company and ask them if we could use this system on their bus drivers. And uh, the management said, uh, well, it's a great idea, but I'm not sure that the unions are going to agree. So uh, I talked with our colleagues from psychology who have been working with this population, and that's the big advantage of having social scientists in the, in the project, one of them. Uh, there are many. I've learned to really appreciate them. Uh, in fact, our colleague uh, from psychology knocked me out with an argument, which was here I was showing this demo, fully excited, and, and then she looks at me and asks, and what was he listening to on the radio while he was driving? <laughs> because, of course, I have no idea how to interpret that data, but that's what they do on a daily basis. And because they do that on a daily basis, they know how to talk with uh, unions and with policemen and with firemen and all these different people. Uh, and they know the data protection uh, rules, and they know how to uh, ensure, uh, you know, anonymity. Only one researcher has a, uh, the match between the number on the file and the actual identity. All of these different 
things that we engineers usually don't think about, but that social scientists are very used to complying with, and we really want to comply and make sure that we, we, we uh, keep uh, individual privacy rights. So uh, our colleague presented the idea to the drivers and the unions, and there was no issue. They understood that this project was about uh, measuring their stress and finding ways and telling management uh, uh, what is happening uh, and, and uh, making suggestions on what one could do to prevent that. So we have now large data sets with a population of about 40 bus drivers and now of course the trajectory goes back and forth because it's a bus and uh, every now and then you see these little circles and that's places where our algorithms uh, detected that uh, something must have happened. Now before the psychology would ask a questionnaire before the trip and at the end of the trip and they wouldn't get a lot of uh, answers because normally the driver would say, well, this was a normal trip, nothing special happened. Now they take a, a tablet and they show this map and now they can go and zoom in on these different areas uh, and, and with this context information of saying, ah, okay, yes, that was in Rua de Alegria uh, and uh, it goes uh, there's a very steep descent there and I had to break and I, I, and I got a bit uh, nervous. And now our, uh, uh, the students who are taking these questionnaires write down in the iPad, okay, what, co what stress factor was there. Then they move on to the next one and then they see, oh, there was a car parked uh, in the bus corridor and I had to go around. Uh, and then you see, start seeing that happening all the time. So one of the main stress factors for our bus drivers in Porto is that uh, certain car drivers just park their car in, in some yeah. way and our streets are very narrow and they have to do all these, all these things. Like, yeah. And so now, you know, the bus company can go to the city and say, you know, this is the, one of the main stress factors, this happens this often and they can tell the city to be stricter with the people who don't obey the rules of uh, the public roads and, and of uh, the bus corridors. And so you can see there he had to really go around and break and you can see exactly what happened when somebody, when somebody uh, puts the car in the wrong place. So they have these people looking at screens the whole day and telling drivers to go faster or go slower. That's a very stressful relationship and that's something that the public bus company can definitely work on. Okay. So well this is the, the example, a very practical, hands-on example, and improves the lives not just of the bus drivers, but also of the passengers, because obviously relaxed drivers uh, drive more safely, and also they also drive in a more pleasant way. That's another thing that we can show with our sensors, is that uh, then you have a smoother ride and everybody is happy. So this is what the project is about, and again, you have to match research interests with business interests, with user interests, and finally with political interests. And when you're able to find the sweet spot uh, of this, then you uh, get results that are both technologically advanced and socially meaningful. Thank you very much.